Good evening, everyone. Um, I am Michelle Gunn, Editor-in-Chief of The Australian, and I'd like to welcome you all here this evening to hear firsthand from Indigenous leader Noel Pearson, someone who has had a deep and at times intense relationship with our newspaper and its readers over many years, I should say over many decades. Thank you, Noel, for agreeing to speak to us this evening as you travel the country campaigning for constitutional recognition and the voice to Parliament. I'd also like to acknowledge a few special guests in the audience. Uh, constitutional lawyer Megan Davis was due to be here. Also, former editor-in-chief of The Australian, Chris Mitchell. Sky host and associate editor of The Australian, Chris Kenny. Chris was, of course, a member of the panel appointed by the previous government to advise on the design of a voice. Before we hear from Noel, I would like to invite to the stage William Warboys for an acknowledgement of the country on which we meet. Will is a proud Wiradjuri student from Dubbo, New South Wales, and he's currently in year 12 and a college prefect, I have to say, at the Scots College. On graduation, he's hoping to go to university to study agricultural engineering. Will is supported by a scholarship from the Australian Indigenous Education Foundation, an organisation very close to the heart of us at The Australian. And it was founded, of course, by Andrew and Michelle Pinfold, who together with William's fellow student, Tyrese Chapman, are also in the audience tonight. Thank you for coming. Will. Good afternoon. My name is William Warboys. I'm a proud Aboriginal student whose family hails from a Rabbitry tribe in Dubbo, New South Wales, about 390 k's from west of Sydney. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, culture and community. I'd acknowledge that we gather here on Gadigal lands of the Euro Nation and pay my respects to Elders past and emerging. I extend my respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. I'm currently in Year 12 at the Scots College here in New South Wales on an AIF scholarship. I've been boarding there since Year 7. I'm committed to my educational journey and have an opportunity to attend Scots has opened many doors. I especially enjoy rugby in cadets and this year being part of the Premiership winning third 15 rugby team. I'm inspired by my grandfather, <laughs> my grandfather Malcolm Morris. A man who plays a large role in my family and the community, connecting us with, with culture throughout hunting, carving and language. In the future, I'd like to finish Year 12 and go to university so I can study agricultural engineering and show the younger generation that it is possible. Whatever I do, I want to make my family proud. Thank you, Will. As I mentioned tonight, we have a very special event for you, an evening with Noel Pearson, which is being streamed live on the Australian's digital platforms and broadcast live on Sky News Voice Debate Channel. Noel comes from the Gugu Yamada community of Hope Vale on the Cape York Peninsula. He is a lawyer, an intellectual, an author, an orator, an activist and an educator. Noel's work over three decades has spanned Indigenous land rights, native title, constitutional law, welfare reform and the transformative power of education for disadvantaged young people. He's the co-founder of the Cape York Land Council and founder of Cape York Partnership and Good to Great Schools Australia and has been a driving force behind numerous other organisations dedicated to relieving entrenched disadvantage of the bottom million. As well as seeking behavioural change in families and communities, think of the Family Responsibilities Commission, Noel has long advocated for structural reforms to empower Indigenous people, including, I'd have to say, his groundbreaking work in education through the promotion of explicit instruction teaching methods in schools. He's also one of the architects, of course, of the Voice to Parliament proposal. 
and has spent decades working towards constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians, deploying his distinctive mix of high intellect, passion and searing cut through. I mentioned earlier in my opening remarks that Noel has had an intense relationship with readers of The Australian. At the 50th birthday celebrations of our masthead almost a decade ago, Noel spoke candidly about the robust and at times challenging nature of that relationship. He spoke of the Australian's role as a pungent participant in the national debate. <laughs> Particularly in respect of our coverage of Indigenous affairs, you can ask him, I'm pretty sure he meant that as a compliment at the time. <laughs> The truth is we have never shirked asking the hard questions. Uh, this year has been no exception. And it is true that things have become tense as passions have flared over the voice proposals. We have tried to produce fair and balanced coverage of all sides of the debate in our news coverage and also in our commentary. The Australian will host a second event on The Voice next week on September 14 in Canberra uh, with Jacinta Nabajimpa Price from the No Campaign. Jacinta, like Noel, is extremely popular with our readers and like him, draws on personal experience of life in remote communities to inform her position. With five weeks to go until voting day, it is, I think, both a responsibility and a privilege to listen to Indigenous leaders such as Noel and Asinta and draw on their wisdom, knowledge and experience to stress test our own views. In a recent piece, Noel wrote that two of his great prayers in life had been answered. Eddie Jones had returned to coach the Wallabies. <laughs> and the nation was on the path to a referendum. Noel's third prayer is for a yes vote from a majority of Australians and a majority of states. The news poll published this week suggests it might be time, Noel, for a little divine intervention. But Noel has faith. He is firm in his belief that Australians will vote yes. He is joined on stage and in conversation tonight by the wonderful Claire Harvey, who is our editorial director and the host of our daily news podcast, The Front. For those of you who don't listen to it every morning, I suggest you do. I hope you have a wonderful evening. I am absolutely certain you will. And I'd like to welcome both Noel and Claire to the stage. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you, Noel, for giving us your time. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. So this is an opportunity to tell us if you want to change one of those prayers. <laughs> Do you want to swap out Eddie Jones for something else? <laughs> We're dealing with Houdini. <laughs> and uh, I was a contender <laughs> back in the day. It all ended in front of St John's at U Sydney University when I was in Colts suddenly and tragically, um, but I always considered myself a Mark Ella brain trapped in a Paul Murray boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be, once the referendum's done, I'm going to count my pennies to see if I can go and see the Wallabies in the finals. That's a good dream. I spent the weekend listening again to your Boyer lectures from last year, which I must recommend to anyone who hasn't heard them. They're a masterfully concise and powerful explanation of the genesis of the voice idea. One of the most compelling arguments you make in those lectures is that the voice would be the ultimate act of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders taking responsibility for the course of their own lives. That idea of responsibility has been at the centre of your life's work. Can you give me a sense of how you see it in the voice context? It's absolutely central. It's an agenda that I started in 1999. I went to see Chris Mitchell at the Korea Mail and he hooked me up with Peter Beattie and our responsibility agenda started from then. 
And of course, the Australian under Chris has been a huge champion of our work on the responsibility side. I'd spent 10 years since university, just down the road here at Phillip Street, I'd spent 10 years fighting for land rights, fighting for rights. Fortuitously, I'd left law school just at the moment of Marbo. But after 10 years, I thought, Rosemary Neal's writing, actually, in The Australian, pricked my conscience, forced me to confront the social and cultural and economic condition of our people. And so Chris really helped us um, with that agenda in Cape York. Um, the Australian was a champion of that agenda, has always been. It was talking about an issue that nobody else was talking about. And I felt that the responsibilities agenda was a complement to the rights agenda that I'd been first focused on. Of course, it meant that I had to, I had to incur the wrath of my uh, fellow travellers on the left who supported me on Mabo and Indigenous rights, but who were very um, perplexed and hostile about this talk about responsibility, seeing it as right-wing language and, and, and resisting it. But, but the two have got to come together, is my conviction. You've got to have rights and responsibilities. I actually support native title and welfare reform. We've got to get the two things in balance. And my entire public life for my people has been dedicated towards getting a complementary approach of rights and responsibilities. And I believe that this voice proposal will lock that whole paradigm together rights and responsibilities, empowerment from the ground up, and what is empowerment other than these two boys, supported by their mothers, supported by their families, climbing to a better life for themselves and eventually giving back to their community. That's empowerment from the ground up, but what has to complement the empowerment is the recognition. So I see it as a pyramid. Empowerment and recognition go together. So we have the opportunity on October the 14th to actually pull the rights and the responsibilities and the empowerment and the recognition together. And I believe that'll be a formula for transformation of my people. Those fellow travellers you mentioned, they're the well-meaning lefties who yeah. are running the voice campaign. Yep. Why are we not hearing from them about responsibility? Why are we only hearing that this is a nice, polite thing to do? Well, 20 years later now, you know, we've been pushing the responsibilities agenda with the support of the Australian. Um, just uh, steadfast support from, fr from the Oz over the two decades. And the conversation spread. Claire has. There's at least a dozen places around Australia in the Kimberley, Sejuna, um, South Australia, Shepparton, La Perouse in this city. And uh, there's a dozen in Arnhem Land with Unipingu's mob. We're all talking the same language about the importance of our right to take responsibility. That's our main right, our right to take responsibility. And until we take responsibility, there'll be no turnaround in closing the gap. You know, Eleanor Roosevelt said, there's nothing the government can do that people are unwilling to do for themselves. And it's, it was true back then, it's true today. And I believe, I have to tell the Australian and my friends who read the Australian, you've got to understand that I'm, if we don't complement rights with responsibilities, and empowerment, people climbing to a better life motivated by a passion for themselves and their children. At the end of the day, you can't have progress unless people are prepared to climb with their own legs. But it's got to be complemented by structural reform as well. Recognition is important. And uh, both psychologically and spiritually and politically, we need structural reform in the form of a voice, 
and an acknowledgement of recognition to pull the whole story together. And as someone who's, who's, who's spent, you know, two decades in my own community having the hard arguments, you think my mob like me talking about responsibility? They love it when I talk about their rights and how they've been victimised through history. They don't like it when I say, take responsibility for your children. Nobody's going to save you until you get your family together and you set them up for a better life. And, and that uh, I can tell you of the fantastic promise and success that I've seen. We run a schools program similar to AIEF. We have 120 kids um, at, at any one time attending the best schools in Queensland and our year 12 retention rate, I saw the figures, 93%. Finish year 12. And Claire, that's 12 years and you get a complete turnaround in life chances. Just 12 years. I know the mothers of these young people you know, they had nothing, and yet they've invested in their kids, and 12 years later, the return on the investment is just amazing. For many months now, there's been a call for detail. You hear it in the corner shop, you hear it on television, you hear it in Parliament, the request for more detail. And we could have a debate about whether enough detail has been provided. But instead, can you paint us a picture of what a typical day or a week or a month in the life of The Voice would be? Where would they be meeting? How many of them would there be? What would they be talking about? And then what? We need voices at the local level. The Conservatives are right about that. We need local and regional voices. That's the important place where deals between government and local communities are made about practical matters relating to health and education and housing and infrastructure. All of those, you know, if, if, if they're not happening at Wilcannia, nothing's happening. It's not happening at Arakun, nothing is happening. So really the, the voice needs to play out at the local level and the regional level. The voice in Canberra needs to tackle the big policy questions that actually determine whether you can do those things on the ground. Like is work for the doll a good thing? Is the CDEP program so called? That's a big policy question and, and government can't just tailor the program community by community. Um, it needs to make big policy decisions in Canberra. Our scholarship programs, they're extremely successful. The, th the three big ones in the country, AIEF being the biggest. Okay, what's the policy lesson to be learned from all of this success we've had out of getting kids into boarding schools? That is a big policy question that we need to advocate in Canberra to say, why aren't we growing this thing that is already proven to be successful? Um, and how can we do more to prepare children back in their primary schools back home so that they can succeed even better when they get to these great schools? Keep on. Okay. So I think, I think um, the, the voice needs to be tackling these 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 large policy questions at the Canberra level, because when you're in, in Yundamu and and you're facing a a, a a program problem, you actually can't find a solution to it unless somebody goes down and gets permission for you to maybe divert the money to something good rather than something useless. There's a lot of duplication on the ground because it's all supply driven. Outside people are supplying myriads of programs. In one community in Cape York Peninsula of about 1,300 people, there were 400 people going in and out of the community providing services to them. And it's all supply driven and whether any of those things work and what effect they have. The mayor of that little township was not aware of all the programs her community was being subjected to. Um, so we've got to unwind that eventually. You know, we've got to make it more rational. We could make the investment much more productive. 
Um, you know, we will if, if if we get more discipline in the in the number of programs we have going into the communities, and we're targeting those things that people really need. What do they need? Health, education, a good home, and income. You know, you, you get those things in order, and that's when you get the you know log cabin to White House. If you get those four things together. Um, good things happen and so I'm seeing this this voice opportunity as a real chance for us to uh, to really make investment in indigenous affairs much more productive and we do that Claire we do that Claire by asking the question of every dollar is this dollar going to empower indigenous families and communities or not? And if the answer is no, why are we doing it? And so would you see those regional voices that you spoke about as part of the, the electoral architecture of the national voice, that this is how people get elected to the voice? Yes. I mean, the, the people in the national voice need to be reflective of those, the footprint. Uh, the footprint has got to be in those communities. Um, the footprint has got to be in Yundamu and Arakun and Wilcania. Um, and I, I just don't think that... Um, and it's going to be a fantastic thing for those communities. Finally, we will be able to connect in those local communities so that they, they're able to... I mean, I see the voice as a, a, a conduit to send an agenda down to Canberra. You know, we're, I'm not interested in Aboriginal politicians representing us in Canberra. I want people who are taking an agenda down to Canberra from Cape York. You know, we, we have an agenda. We're very clear about the things we want. We want spokespeople to go and take the agenda to Canberra. We don't want to elect, you know, quasi-politicians to shoot off at the mouth or come up with hairbrand ideas by themselves. I think this is part of the hesitation of many Australians about the voice that, um, that some, some people are concerned that it will be the same group of people who we're familiar with hearing from being elected to the voice. It will be essentially quasi-politicians. I, I think Australians are, are yet to see the, the talent that sits under my generation. In Cape York Peninsula, we now have children who've come through our schools programs, who've gone on to study, and I'm saying, don't come back yet. Go and work in the corporate sector or in government. You'll be more useful for us in 10, 20 years' time. You know, don't do what I did, rush back and try to save the mob. Um, I want you guys to have fulfilling careers. And that... And you, the networks you're going to bring back to us, you know, 15, 20 years down the track, um, are going to be so much more valuable. Um, but at the same time, I have to say, we have cultivated a leadership. Um, you know, in, in Cape York Peninsula, all of the people running the organisations I founded, or I worked with people to found, they're run by young women of the 30s and 40s, who are just absolutely, um, you know, they're, they're the people who are going to make the voice work. So do you think the voice will be, you know, 24 people who we've never heard of here in this room tonight? Well, I won't be there. You know, I'm helping to set up a structure that works for, for people because mm. we've got leaders who can fulfil those roles. Mm. Um, I think that... Uh, you know, having the, having the voice will be crucial if we also do the voice at the local level. You know, the, um, the, the Conservatives are correct about that. We need a voice structure at the local level so that local communities can see that, you know, um, we can actually get solutions from government. Um, uh, rather than banging our heads against the wall. So tonight you've given us more detail than I've heard in many, many weeks of the Voice campaign going so far. Why can't the Yes campaign say it'll be a building in Canberra, it'll meet four times a year, there'll be 24 people on it, and they'll give advice to government which government can ignore or not? OK, Claire, 
I've got to explain this. That's model A. There might be a model B that has 25 people, not 24, or 32, or 18, right? It'll depend on the government of the day and the parliament of the day as to what. And the problem with our constitution is you can't spell out model A, B, C, D, E, F, all possibilities. All you can do is leave it to the parliament to determine at the time what the details are. And the actual provision that we're voting on, the 92 words that we vote on, on October the 14th, actually says, this is the answer to the question of detail. The parliament shall have power to make laws. That's the answer to the detail. The parliament shall have power to make laws about the voice, including its composition functions, powers, and procedures. In other words, everything about the voice is subject to Parliament. And guess whose job it is to supply the detail? It's actually not the government. The provision doesn't say the government shall. The provision says the Parliament shall. So, you know, I or the leader of the government, or anybody else could say, this is the detail here. That is only a proposition. The actual detail needs to go through the House, and it needs to go through the Senate. It's got to get a majority somehow through the Senate, not controlled by the government. And in five, ten years' time, it's entirely possible that a new parliament decides, oh, we want to change the voice. And they could do that. The, a new parliament could change the model of the voice. That is our democracy. That is how our lawmaking process works. We, the people, amend the constitution and then it's the parliament that enacts the laws under the, the powers that we've approved. So it, it's, this whole debate about detail has been deceptive. It has been deceptive because nobody can really say it's Model A or it's Model X. You know, the only, the only honest answer to the what is the detail question is the detail will be determined by Parliament. I'm glad you mentioned Yundamu. In the Australian, we've got a long history of reporting from Yundamu and from a whole lot of other remote communities where substance abuse and violence are rampant. That reporting is wildly unpopular with the fellow travellers, the well-meaning lefties. They accuse us of being racist for just for reporting those issues. So are they ready for, if there is a Yundamu voice that's speaking up to a national voice, are they ready for what they're going to hear? It's going to be important in the, my proposition this, it's going to be important in the design of the legislation for the voice that dissenting voices be formally allowed, like a parliamentary committee. You know, there might be a consensus view of the voice about something, but if the Cape York wants alcohol control, we should be able to give that advice. If Cape York wants welfare reform, Patrick, we should be able to say that, even if the current is against it. That's going to be important, I think, to allow particular communities or regions that, are, that, that have different views to other, to, to other regions uh, or to the overwhelming consensus. It's going to be very important to put into the voice legislation this ability for dissenting voices to come forward. And... At the end of the day, it's our parliament that decides what it does with these contrary views. And, and parliament makes a judgment. Claire, it's going to be crucial for the government to maintain its own policy view. You know, government wants social returns. Government wants good results. 
Government's got a responsibility to make sure that Indigenous people are safe and, and they've got opportunities to lead good lives. I don't think government abandoning its own policy preferences um, would be a good thing. It's, the outcome has to be one of the voice and the parliament working together and, and hopefully aligning, getting agreement and alignment in the, in the things that need to be done to close the gap. Let's talk about treaty. It's never been a secret that the voice process also involves makarata, truth-telling, and the coming together after a conflict, treaty-making. So, is the next step conversations about a national Commonwealth treaty with First Nations people? Well, that is an aspiration, but the treaty agenda was started even before the Uluru Statement. It started in Victoria, and it started in Queensland with bipartisan support. So the legislation for the, for the treaty framework in Queensland is actually supported by the LNP opposition. So that's, that's, all, that's, been, that's an old aspiration in, in Indigenous policy. Um, whether it becomes part of the, the federal policy story will depend on people returning to the advocacy convincing the government, convincing the parliament, that's something for way down the track, 20, 30 years it's going to take. Um, but the, the question we have in front of us now, of course, is the question of the voice and its enshrinement in the constitution. The calls for treaty were, as you say, very loud um, a generation ago. And then we went down a different path, which was reconciliation and sorry. Mm. Um, uh, did we take the wrong path when you're trying to get major reform? On the importance of what we're doing now, and it is an agenda that, you know, was specifically cultivated with the former Prime Minister, John Howard. He was the one who kicked off this phase the first speech in favour of constitutional recognition was Prime Minister Howard on the eve of the 2007 election. We wouldn't be in this process had, in some way, Nixon not gone to China. <laughs> and uh, he committed in that speech at the Sydney Institute on the eve of the election that uh, he would take a referendum question to the Australian people within 18 months. It's 15 years later. 15 years, nine of which have been um, presided over by conservative governments, and all of which have been committed to constitutional recognition. Ever since 2007, there has been a bipartisan commitment to constitutional recognition. And um, it's just that uh, I'm talking northern football language, nobody picked the ball up. And um, the Albanese government has now decided to do that. They de decided last May to pick up the ball. But all of the conversation prior to that were, was a conversation under the aegis of conservative governments. We're just really finishing work that was um, that was undertaken during those years from Abbott to Morrison. At that moment, and you spoke about this powerfully in the Boyer lectures, it, it was a moment when you know you spoke frankly, and, and John Howard spoke frankly about relations between him and Indigenous leaders falling apart falling into silence, you make the point that the voice is a mechanism for that to not happen again. Absolutely. So that's another idea that I feel Australians should know about. You know? Yeah, yeah. Why are we not hearing more about that? I think, I think we've got a challenge over the next six weeks with the campaign to speak to the middle 
we have we know that we have hard yeses and we have hard noes but it is a big mob in the middle up to 30 percent that are undecided and that group in the middle does comprise strictly undecided people um, but it also comprises what they call the, the so-called soft yeses and the soft noes our pathway to success is to listen to the soft nose. We've got to listen respectfully to those people who have reservations or questions or concerns. We have to answer their questions. We've got to deal with them in good faith. We have to believe that their questions come from a good place. They are well motivated. But unless our campaign answers their questions, they're going to continue to have them. And so really, our, our secret weapon in this next six weeks will be the engagement of those soft nose in the middle to treat every Australian that has question marks about this referendum seriously and to answer their questions and treat them with, with the respect and intelligence that they deserve. I've been around the countryside now for seven weeks, and I've spoken to Australians from all ge geographies and political backgrounds. I came last night from an extraordinary meeting with the Warrigal community in Victoria, Darren Chester's National Party country. <laughs> and I could not have been more pleased at the willingness of people to put their questions and listen to answers. And it behoves the Yes campaign to treat respectfully the questions that Australians have. You know, the soft no's are the ones that we have to speak to. We've got to speak to the... If we're going to have a pathway to success, we have to speak to the soft nose. And a lot of their questions are extremely on point and they deserve clear answers. And I've found that when I've done that, when I've provided a clear answer, usually the clear answer is contained in the 92 words. If I take them through the provision, I, I see that a lot of the questions they have are being answered. So it's going to take um, the Yes campaign um, has got to find the humility and patience and respect that Australians are contemplating a change to their most sacred document. <laughs> Thank it you. is it is an important document to everyone, and it should not be lightly changed. Many and of the sorry sorry. Many of those no's are people who are opening an eight hundred dollar bill from the power company, mm. uh, who haven't had a pay rise for years. Do you wish this was happening at a time when we weren't having a cost of living crisis? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know. The, the, this is the moment when Halley's Comet is passing. <laughs> and Halley's Comet doesn't have much respect for inflation. <laughs> um, so we've got to grab it. We've got to lasso Halley's Comet and, and make the best of it. Can I say, people in the bush and in the Torres Strait, they empathise with the challenges that Australians are having. They know that this is a hard time to have this discussion. But you know what a two gallon, you know, two litre milk bottle is in Arakoon? You've got 12 bucks. You've got a kilo of rice. You know, the prices out there are just horrendous. They're three, four times prices in cans. And the income levels are a third of everybody else. 
So people with a third of the income of the rest of the country are paying three times the price. In Torres Strait, I was there three weeks ago, and of course the big issue is freight. And, um, you know, if we could solve the freight problems of supplying food essentials to remote communities, um, we would be solving a mighty problem. But, Claire, I completely understand that um, Australians are doing it hard. And um, where we have this opportunity, though, to, to deal with an issue that will serve us well in good times and hard times in the future. So we're, we're, we're asking the Australian people to, to um, uh, deal with the referendum question uh, with generosity and understanding. We've got some questions already from our audience. If you're here in the room tonight or watching on the live stream, you can go to slido.com slash the voice debate and ask us a question. I'm getting them here on this iPad, which just momentarily failed, but has come back to life, thank goodness. One of these questions speaks to that question of remoteness. Um, isn't the biggest problem, Amanda asks, the remoteness of communities rather than lack of effort? How can the voice help that? Um, you know, remoteness is a big factor, but we're seeing, and, and some of the solutions that uh, are purely a result of that, but there's a whole lot of other factors as well. Enabling communities to have the necessary land tenure to enable investment. We now, after Mabo, have got lots of land. But we don't have the tenures to enable investment, to make it attractive for investors to come in and help us build industries that can offer jobs to our people. Now, we've, we've spoken in Cape York about the necessity of investment-ready tenure. If we get organised in making tenures available for investment, we can attract um, investors from outside. But that requires a lot of support from government. The government's got to help us. There's got to be some law changes, policy changes. We've got to invest in the creation of new tenures. Um, those are things that the voice needs to advocate. You know, many of these communities have never been surveyed. And how can you have a property system if a town has, has not been surveyed? Every Australian town has got the advantage of having been surveyed sometime over the last two centuries. This has not happened in Aboriginal communities. And we need government to focus on this, um, to put in the property systems that communities need in order to engage in in enterprise and attract investment. These are things that only government can help us sort out. And if we had, um, if we had a voice, we would certainly be advocating the necessity for government to work with communities to make their land create the kind of economic development that they need. It's almost a truism that in Australia you need bipartisanship for a referendum to succeed. Peter Dutton has spoken about regional voices. He's spoken about a second referendum if this one fails. Can you talk a little bit about his positions and about whether the yes side tried hard enough to get the Conservatives in Parliament House on side? We tried for 15 years, and we succeeded. We had John Howard start the process. And then at every election since then, the Liberal National Party had policies committed to constitutional recognition. They set up processes, parliamentary processes and public consultation processes, that eventually led to the voice. We went, you know, Indigenous people 
engaged in the democratic processes of Australia to come up with the voice. We played according to the rules. We participated in parliamentary consultations. We put submissions in. There were three parliamentary con processes during these 15 years and three public consultation processes. No public policy issue has been the subject of more report writing and process than this one. And Indigenous people participated in good faith. And when we, when we were advised by retired High Court judges not to chuck five, six, seven, eight proposals into the bucket of constitutional reform to the parliament, our advice that we received was, have one good idea. That's it. We took the advice. And we believed that the voice was the best idea. And yet, there's, all, there's been this kind of retrospective storytelling about how the, the loss of bipartisanship was a, was a consequence of unreasonableness. Um, the, the, every pivot along this process was undertaken by Indigenous people. Every pivot. Whenever you're in a negotiation, somebody's got to move. It's just that we were negotiating with, or not even negotiating, we were dealing with um, uh, governments that indicated no position along the way. And every move to advance this thing came from us. Oh, we better make sure that the High Court can't use this to interpret some radical view of the Constitution. We were the ones who wanted the thing to be injusticiable. And so all along, um, and we've arrived at a very safe proposal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put a Geiger counter on this, you won't get a beep out of it. <laughs> you know, it is, it is as inert as, as a constitutional provision <laughs> um, can ever be. Because it's just setting up a body, it's authorising the parliament to do it, and, and the body will make representations. What's make representations? It's Democracy 101. And the Mining Industry Council makes representations. Parliament may or may not listen to them. Qantas makes representations and is always <laughs> listening to <laughs> But you know what I mean. Making representations is what all citizens do and all organisations do. And that's all the voice will be able to do. It's an advisory committee. It's an advisory committee in the true meaning of the word. And yet Indigenous people chose the, the voice as their most preferred idea and you know I, I think they were that 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 was the right decision but it, it is you know in the in the scheme of things it is such a modest proposal it is so modest it's not going to change our democracy our lawmaking process will remain in the hands of the elected MPs and senators the voice changes nothing about the way the lawmaking process works. Nothing. It doesn't delay it, doesn't limit it, doesn't hinder it. None of the advice it provides needs to be listened to. If it changes nothing, why do you need it? Because we expect the parliament to listen to the advice and if it's good advice, to follow it. Yeah. They're saying no. Why do you think the voice will listen to you if they won't listen to them? 
Well, the voice will be a constitutional body. It'll be recognised by the constitution, backed by the will of the Australian people. And, of course, none of the advice will be binding. One of the most clear reasons in my mind for the voice is the issue of rheumatic heart disease. A big problem in remote communities. Problem shared with Bangladesh and India. Once you have the fever as a child or a toddler, your heart is compromised for life. And you're susceptible to early death. It's a disease that's been eradicated all around the world. All around the world. And yet the cases in remote Australia are still tragically very high. If you ever hear of a football player who has died suddenly on a pitch in a remote community, you can almost bet for your life that that's a case of rheumatic heart disease. Anyway, I checked the hand side for our local member who's represented um, Cape York and the Torres Strait for 26 years. 26 years. And he's uttered not one word about rheumatic heart disease. So why not? What's wrong with parliamentary democracy? Well, that is the problem. It's a competitive place. And people have got... Politicians have got lots of other agendas that they're attending to. By having a voice that's hounding the parliament and the government of the day to say, listen, I know you've got all of those other issues to deal with, but how about some attention to rheumatic heart disease? And that's why we need a voice. You can't just rely on the, 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 the MPs themselves. There are many issues we need to bring forward to the attention of the lawmakers and the government. There are many issues, and having a voice will be crucial in that process. Several people in our audience have asked, why can't it just be legislated? And I think they're asking from the point of view that that would have been easier, that would have been achievable. So why not? The other provision that's in, in this is a guarantee, the guarantee of permanency, that a government dissatisfied with a voice can just scrap it and never replace it. And the words in the actual provision read, there shall be a body. That's the guarantee. There shall be a body. And it is the Australian people, if they approve this at a referendum, if they approve this the Australian people will be telling the parliament, whatever happens, you can have model A, model B, model C, whatever, you can change it. That's your power as a parliament. But there's one thing that the constitution says is there shall be a body. Sorry? All citizens having the same civil and Okay. I thought I answered that by saying nothing in the parliamentary process is affected by this. I think that... The voice is a voice outside of the parliament into the parliament. It's not part of the parliamentary process. So our democracy, the core of our democracy is unaffected by... Um, the insertion of a voice. But the answer about the question, this, I have two answers to that. One, there is a special category of law that Parliament is responsible for and has been conferred by the Constitution that only applies to Indigenous people. And that is Section 5126, the Race Power. The race power is a provision that only applies to our people. 
It doesn't affect you. It doesn't affect anybody else. And so in the exercise of that power, our position is that shouldn't it be entirely reasonable that when you only, when you only exercise a power with respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, should you not talk to them about it or listen to their views about it? So 5126 is a one reason why um, the, the, the need for the parliament to hear the views of Indigenous people is very plain. Because, because it's the race power and race is an outdated concept or should be, there is, there is every susceptibility that a law generated under a race power could be racially discriminatory. And for that reason, um, for that reason, receiving the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people whenever Parliament is contemplating a law, exercising a a law under that provision um, is justified in my view. Claire, one basic other reason in answer to the moral... What were your words, sorry? The moral absolute. Moral, moral absolute. Let me talk about another moral absolute. <laughs> the preambular words to this provision read this. In recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia. We're doing this to recognise another moral absolute, to borrow his terminology. And that is a kind of simple fact that we were the first peoples of Australia. You reckon we could do this? You reckon we could recognise that before 26 January 1788 there were a people in this country? And those are the words in recognition as the first peoples of Australia. The profundity of what we will do in terms of recognition and the importance of it, I think that is the moral profundity. Please join me in thanking Noel Pearson. I'll ask Michelle to come to the stage. Noel, thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate your time very deeply. Thank you very much for giving us your, uh, your wisdom. I'd like to, Michelle to close the event. Thank you, Noel. And thank you, Claire, for what I'm sure all of you will agree was a, a fascinating, profound, interesting, challenging discussion. I would also especially like to thank all of you uh, in the audience, either attending here or on our live stream, for your support of our paper and its journalists through your subscriptions. These events are important for the newspaper. They strengthen the relationship between our editors, our writers and our readers and that can only be a force for good. I've often said that the readers of The Australian are among the most engaged consumers of media in the country. You are an intelligent, curious, demanding and analytical bunch, just the sort of reader Rupert Murdoch had in mind in 1964 when he invited purchasers of that very first edition of the paper to join us in what he described as a company of progress. Many things have, of course, changed in the 59 years since, but the need for a quality national paper, whether delivered in print or online, to stimulate debates about issues of national importance, like this one, to cover the cities and the bush, and I'd... I'd uh, I'd just like to say our, our uh, Indigenous Affairs reporter, Paige, who's Paige Taylor, is watching this debate tonight, Noel, from Bibianga uh, in WA. 
where she's doing some reporting on The Voice. So I repeat, to cover the cities and the bush, to focus on the big picture remains absolutely critical. So thank you again for valuing our work and for joining us, for joining Noel and Claire in that conversation. Claire will be in conversation, as I mentioned at the beginning of this evening, with Jacinta Napajimba Price next Tuesday evening in Canberra to explore her views from the perspective of the No campaign. So for those who are interested, be sure to register online or by using the QR code in print. We hope to see you then or at one of our other subscriber events soon. So thank you again, Noel, Claire, thank you all and good evening. Thank you.